introduce our guest. Okay, yes, my name is Rosemary Cornell. I'm kind of a newcomer to the Environment Committee of UCV, and uh, but I'm very honored and happy to be here. Um, so actually my first introduction of the evening is to our featured place, Apicatsum House Sound. And I can't think of a better way of introducing this place than with this uh, glorious movie um, produced by one of our speakers, which we are going to show now. And then shortly uh, right after that, I will introduce the two speakers. Cindy. Oh, <laughs> my grandkids are coming up, but the movie's coming right after. There we go. <laughs> I'm not seeing anything yet, Cindy. Oh, really? No. No? No. Okay, sorry. I don't know why it didn't work. It should have just stuck when we start again. Okay, try that again. Do you see anything? I see your grandson. <laughs> He's very cute. <laughs> okay, perfect. Now it should come up. Ah, um, uh, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you. I've watched that movie many times and every time um, I get a bit choked up. 
But um, okay, I would like to introduce the Turner brothers, Bob and Tim. Um, so uh, Bob Turner is the one who, uh, the photographer who made that film. We'll have another one coming up soon. Um, Bob is uh, a geoscientist. He worked with the federal government for many years. He is the two-time, two-term mayor of, of uh, Bowen Island. And um, <clears throat> he uh, was a director of the um, House Sound at the Katsum, uh, Biosphere Region Initiative. And another recent project of his is to, uh, uh, to make a marine map of Bowen Island where he lives. Um, his brother, Tim, is uh, an educator. He lives in Gibsons and um, I think for more than 20 years was the director of Sea to Sky Outdoor School and Sustainability Education, which um, delivers programs for thousands of students every year. He's also a board member of the organization My Sea to Sky, which is an organization that aims to protect uh, the natural legacy of um, Apple Katzen House Sound. And um, yeah, we are very pleased to have you here. So take it away, Bob and Tim. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Rosemary. Uh, the, <clears throat> the video that we just saw of Bob's is one of my favorite. Uh, it just uh, is a powerful reminder of how much I feel I am How Sound, and I, I love that title. Uh, it's a precious place we, uh, we all share. And, uh, you know, for Bob and I, uh, we've been uh, adventuring together uh, for the last 65 years. Uh, ever since uh, we could walk, uh, we were uh, in a uh, a wild setting in Algonquin Park, uh, summers at, at a cabin and, uh, and spring canoe trips with our father. And that led to a, uh, a remarkable teenage canoe trip, three week canoe trip on the Nahani River in the Northwest Territories. And uh, so that was the beginning. And then uh, a life changing uh, year world traveling to places like Western Samoa and India and Afghanistan uh, really messed with how we saw the world in the best way. And we came back and we just continued to have fun together. And we did week long back trips in Zion, uh, Capitol Reef, Arches National Parks on the Colorado Plateau and uh, just really enjoyed um, spending time with each other. Uh, we ended up in Vancouver uh, in the early 80s, and uh, we weren't, uh, of course, very far from that beautiful arm of the Salish Sea that we call, call uh, Katsum House Sound. And uh, so very quickly, uh, we went in different directions. Uh, I, uh, I moved to Gibson's uh, with my partner, Wendy, and uh, we suddenly had a... Um, a front yard called a Katsum House Sound, uh, southwest corner of House Sound, and had a young family, and that was our go-to. Uh, the outer islands of House Sound were where we spent our time, and uh, and then that morphed, as things often do, into Sea to Sky Outdoor School, and uh, 26 years of um, taking kids all over Keats Island and Gambier Island and all the water in between, and. Uh, uh, you know, that was uh, sort of the, um, the clincher. Uh, I don't think we'll ever leave Gibson's. And uh, in the uh, early 90s, uh, con consistent with this, all this time in House Sound, um, I volunteered and became a member of the House Sound Roundtable. And then uh, am now, as Rosemary indicated, a, a director with... Uh, uh, the Gambier Island Conservancy, uh, also with the uh, BC Spaces for Nature, which is based in Gibson's, and uh, a board member of My Sea to Sky. Uh, 
And uh, it's just uh, one very uh, simple way of giving back to a place that um, seems to be uh, a lifelong love affair. So over to Bob, because there's, uh, there's another there's another guy. I don't know, Bob, if I've left you any time for your introduction, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Yeah, so um, Tim's covered a lot of ground there. Um, Rosemary, my wife, uh, and I moved to Bowen in 1989. And um, <clears throat> I'll never forget that first ferry ride across over to Bowen. It was, um, it was a February morning, blue sky, fresh snow in the mountains, pretty much like today. Um, and this sort of big green surround along the water and the islands. And uh, I just remember looking up the sound and, and just thinking to myself, this is enough. Um, this is enough to keep me busy for the rest of my life. And um, interesting, that's pretty much how it's played out. Uh, I think Tim could say the same thing. Um, you know, I, 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 I worked with the federal government as, as a scientist. I, I got into local politics. Um, my favorite line out of that was um, the definition of an island, um, differences of opinion surrounded uh, by water. Um, that was sort of um, my, my big takeaway from local politics. Um, I retired in 2014 and that really allowed me, Tim and I, done a lot in how sound but um, as of 2014 being retired or as other people call it refired or rewired whatever it is that happens um, I um, really had time to get into how sound and uh, I also at the same time sort of just discovered I loved making movies uh, and just how dead simple it was you know or a reasonable video camera um, a um, when I started free software, editing software, and um, sign up for a free YouTube channel, and suddenly you're a film director. <laughs> and uh, so I just, uh, I just found it was a way that I could go out in the kayak or go snorkeling with Tim or um, go hiking with Tim and um, you know, take video, come home, turn it into a story, and then share some remarkable stuff with people. So that was... Um, 25 movies later or so, I have a YouTube channel. Um, you can find it if you just search Bob Turner on YouTube. Um, just a, um, you know, over the retirement period too, I think my other great joy, and I'll talk about this later, has been working with the, the Biosphere Initiative. Um, and I'll come back to that. Just, just a word about At Katsum, which is the, the name we're, we're all using for How Sound. Um, it, it, it's, it's got a lovely backstory because at Katsum is the, the Skohomish people's name for what we call how sound, but they only use at Katsum when they are paddling seaward, when they're essentially going from Squamish and heading out to the Salish Sea and around into Burrard Inlet. When they are going north back into the inlet, it is Chuck Nowitz. And I just think that's a, a wonderful statement of sort of their intimacy with the land that the name of the water body changes depending on the direction you're paddling. Um, so anyways, the next movie, we got a second one for you, is um, one that Tim and I put together for the Sea to Sky Marine Trail. And we thought it was sort of a good introduction just because it it's got some maps, it shows the geography, um, it follows us as we sort of do this five day tour. Uh, we bump into some of the, the hot button issues in the, in the sound. And um, for those of you who like to cliff jump, um, Tim will reveal a couple of his two favorite spots. So um, yeah, take it away on the Sea to Sky Marine Trail movie. <clears throat> We need audio. Cindy, are you working on the audio?
So um, one possibility is that this movie, there's actually a link to it right in the chat. It may be because I was muted. I had muted myself. So okay. I'll do it again. I just didn't realize that I muted myself. The screen share wouldn't show the sound. Sorry. Everybody else should be muted except for Cindy. See the Sky Marine Trail. a new marine trail in Howe Sound. The trail connects Horseshoe Bay to Squamish, but with all the islands in Howe Sound, there's just so much more shoreline to explore. The six new campsites add to the three provincial campgrounds to create a remarkable network of opportunities. So my brother Tim and I figured we'd better get out and take a look. We have five days, a good weather window, and a real curiosity about what we'll find. So we start our trip at the government dock in Horseshoe Bay. It's an easy place to access. From there, we head across the channel to Bowen Island. Scott Cove with its kayak rentals is another easy starting point for the Sea to Sky Marine Trail, or just as a fun stop to watch what's going on, to pick up some groceries or maybe have a meal. From Bowen, we paddled the island's south shore, then crossed the mouth of Howe Sound to the waterfront village of Gibsons. Gibsons has a busy boat harbor, great shoreline pubs and restaurants, and just about any trip supplies you need. Man, I wish we could leave it. The short paddle got us to our first camp at Plumper Cove Marine Park. Holy oh, That was a full day, boy. Plumper Cove has 20 first come first serve campsites with fire pits and picnic tables. Are you guys enjoying the Oh, we are. We love this place. Yeah, Tim's from Gibson's. I'm from Bowen Island. We're just doing a kayak trip around uh, House Sound. The next morning, we poke our way through the outer islands of House Sound on our way to a camp at Halkett Bay Park on Gambier Island. We snorkel some shorelines, always curious about what's just below the surface. By evening, we still haven't left the outer islands. They're just so magical. In low light, we arrive in the quiet waters of Halkett Bay. What's the deal? Uh, we just did self-registration. Sign in. Uh, five bucks a person per night. Alcat Bay has three pretty lovely campsites. Fit toilets, but beware, no well water. The following day, we head up the east shore of Gambier Island on our way to the new campsite at Ramillion's Channel. The Ramillion's Channel campsite is on a low bench just behind a lovely beach that looks east. Behind the camp is a rough trail that heads up to some big overlooks of the wild heart of Gander Island and House Sound. Close the door. You gotcha. Probably about an hour to look at. Looping north from the viewpoints, we descend through old growth forests to Gambier Creek. Where the creek meets the sea at Douglas Bay, there's another fine campsite. The 
The next morning, we detoured to Pam Rocks and Christie Island, looking for seals and cormorants, before heading north to McNabb Creek. McNabb Creek Estuary has one of the few sand beaches on Howe Sound and is a place rich with wildlife. It's always worth a visit. Sadly, a major gravel mine is proposed for its shores. East of McNabb along the shoreline and past Potlatch Camp is the new Isle View campsite. It has a gorgeous south-facing view of Anvil Island and is tucked back in the trees. Sometimes the morning calm on Howe Sound makes it seem more like a lake than the ocean. Before heading east to Porto Cove, we detour south to wild Anvil Island. Anvil Island, back side, wild side. I guess every side wild. Crossing to the busier east shore, we head north to Puerto Cove Provincial Park. Puerto Cove really bustles with people, and reservations for campsites are required from March to October. Things here are pretty civilized. There are toilets, drinking water, fire circles and firewood, even showers. Well, today is our last day. From here, we paddle the narrow inner sound to Squamish. Our first stop is the attractive beach at the mouth of Furry Creek. A thin strip of forest gives the beach some privacy from the development behind it. At Britannia, you can pull ashore at one of the beaches or at the little marina. It's a fun stop. You can shop, be amazed at the busyness of the highway, and yet, you're surrounded by history everywhere. North of Britannia is the big granite peninsula of Watts Point. Across the waters is the proposed site of the controversial wood fiber LNG plant. There are huge public concerns about the impacts it will have on House Sound's waters, as well as risks to public safety. Beyond is the northernmost sound, and then the mouth of the Squamish River. Here we enter the rich wetlands of the Squamish Estuary, unlike anything else we've seen in Howe Sound. We want to linger. It's the trip's end, but we're in no rush to finish. Oh, oh I wonder where you went. And so we reach Squamish Harbor and the end of our trip. Thank you, Gordon McKeever, for creating the Sea to Sky Marine Trail. What a gift to all of us. Horseshoe Bay to Squamish on the Sea to Sky Marine Trail. Okay. You did it. <laughs> How many kilometers is that? Hey, let's just put a handshake there, buddy. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, Gordon, great campsites all the way. <laughs> so, uh, so the talk of Tim and my uh, presentation tonight is whales uh, and the revolution they inspired to protect that cut somehow sound. And whales is a reference to the remarkable return of marine mammals in Howe Sound over the past 20 years. Um, so to talk about that, let's go back in time a bit. Um, back in the uh, 1800s, humpback whales were everywhere through the Salish Sea, including Howe Sound. Um, but once whaling got mechanized, uh, they were quickly exterminated in the last, um, the last, uh, whale was hunted down in, in Howe Sound in 1908. Um, at about the same time, um, 
how some was being industrialized. Two major pulp mills were um, built um, and uh, the, joined the Britannia mine along its shores. And all of these three big industrial complexes were disposing their waste into Howe Sound. And pulp mill pollution likely peaked in the 1970s as each of these fil um, facilities expanded, but had yet to sort of encounter environmental regulations. Up until the 1960s, um, there was a big herring population in Howe Sound, but that collapsed in the mid 70s, um, which was a huge blow to the Howe Sound because herring feed everything. They feed um, marine birds, marine mammals, they feed salmon. Um, and so the, the ocean that Tim and I first came to in the late 80s um, was a quiet ocean. And I can remember paddling in those days um, it was a beautiful place then, but I never expected to see anything break the surface. You know, the odd seal, yes, but nothing bigger. Um, anyways, things really started to pivot in the late 80s because um, Greenpeace had discovered dioxins in coastal um, pulp mill effluent. There was a huge public outcry. The federal government jumped in with some new pollution standards and the province really took on cleaning up Britannia. And all of these... Um, uh, positive changes really came to a head in 2007 um, when wood fiber pulp mill and um, closed down and the new water treatment plant at Britannia came on stream and suddenly these twin giant um, sources of, of toxic effluent were shut down and what is so astounding was just how quickly life came back. Um, that was 2007. In 2008, the first humpback in 100 years swam into Howe Sound. Uh, just remarkable queuing. And uh, in 2011, 2012, we had huge schools, 100 plus um, animals of, uh, of, um, dol of um, white sided dolphins that were in and out of Howe Sound a um, number of times. Killer whales, which had been largely absent since the 1970s. Uh, reappeared. Uh, in 2015, giant schools of, of um, anchovy showed up in Howe Sound, which just created more food. Anchovy or sort of warm water cousins of herring created more food for marine mammals. Um, and so humpback whales and orcas and sea lions were all sort of coming into the sound. And so it, it's really remarkable how things have changed over Tim and my um, time in Howe Sound. And uh, it's, it's a, it's a, a rook it's a work in progress, the recovery. It's not, not everything's recovered, but it has so fundamentally changed the nature of how sound it's extraordinary. Um, so I'll hand it over to Tim just to talk about his own personal reflections on the water over those 25 years. So <clears throat> what, what would take me to the water would be the, the uh, 10 meter Voyager canoes uh, full of students working from uh, Keats Camp on Keats Island or Camp Artaban on Gambier, Camp Furcom on Gambier, Camp Latona up in the northwest corner of Gambier. Uh, all of these places uh, were uh, great access points for largely the outer sound. And the observations that I would say over the 30 years that Sea to Sky was out there, uh, at least uh, on my watch, uh, because Sea to Sky continues to this day, um, would be that um, a very significant change on the west side of Gambier Island. Uh, what used to have an armored shoreline of um, log booms it have, have largely disappeared, which means that the Shoreline uh, is way more aesthetic and way more accessible. Um, and as Bob has indicated, the, the frequency of big mammal sightings, lots more sea lions, uh, lots more uh, orca, lots more humpback, occasionally a gray whale. Uh, what I remember was uh, an off chance sighting each year uh, became a regular sighting almost monthly in the last five years. Uh, so that, that has, that's been huge. Um, but, I, you know, uh, a mixed blessing uh, because uh, over that same period of time, 
uh, population pressures have have really um, shown themselves in terms of the amount of um, you know uh, pleasure craft on the water. Also, the amount of uh, pleasure properties that are popping up along the waterfront. And you know, Bob and I have talked about that. You know, the suburbanization of 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 at Catsum House Sound, where large um, uh, property development tracks, housing tracks, uh, and uh, commercial logging are just incrementally cutting away at the green cover of the old forests uh, that blanket the islands and east and west slopes of at Katsum. So uh, it, it is still very much uh, a beautiful place. Uh, even though that eastern shoreline of Gambier from Halkett Point up to uh, Eakins Point is peppered with cottage properties, big development at Brigade Bay, big development at Douglas Bay, it still has wild pockets and access into a wild in interior. So it's an amazing place and it reminds me of a, a young um, student from Richmond who thought she heard how sound, uh, but uh, or thought she heard wow sound. And so um, she called it um, wow sound, which has completely changed um, the way I see this body of water. It really is in very large measure a wow sound. So if you have trouble pronouncing at Katsum, just go with wow sound. <laughs> Uh, in 2016, uh, another uh, insight was uh, Wendy and I uh, took off on a six week trip into the Salish Sea from Gibson's northern end of the Salish Sea. An unforgettable moment was on our last day when we came back into Howe Sound and um, saw it for the first time. It was, in our estimation, the most beautiful sea and landscape that we had seen uh, in the 40 days that we were out. And uh, it was a reminder of just how incredibly special this place is by Salish Sea standards. So that, uh, that brings us to another question or uh, the first uh, three minute question period, Rosemary. Okay. So we're going to have it, the floor open. If I think the easiest way to do it really is just to raise your hand. I think I can see everybody um, do a little finger and uh, ask some questions about what you've heard so far. Okay, Sharon, unmute yourself, Sharon. Hello. Hi, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> Rosie's my mom. <laughs> um, I just had a question um, if the, you guys knew anything about the wolves that have been living on Gambier Island. I just recently heard about this this year and haven't heard any real information. So I was wondering if you knew of, um, of the wolves that have been seen consistently on Gambier. What we've heard uh, um... The Gambier uh, Island Conservancy uh, has heard lots of reports. We think there's five. Uh, unfortunately, one might have been taken out because it killed uh, a local's dog. Um, but there are generally over uh, on the southeast corner of the island, all the way up to Brigade Bay. And uh, it uh, is just an incredible, uh, sort of feature of this wild heart of a cat somehow sound that this island can support wolves. And uh, it, uh, I'm sure that you're as surprised as we are when we heard that news. Yeah, I was, that, thanks for answering. Well, I just learned something. I didn't know about that. Great news. <clears throat> uh, I don't see any hands. I'm gonna ask a quick one. Um, uh, in your little right up here, you talked about restoration of eelgrass. Um, so, are there uh, many settings where there is eelgrass along the um, the boundaries of the islands, and uh, 
what are people doing about restoration of that? Yeah, eelgrass matters because um, eelgrass is um, is a flowering plant that grows in oh you know five to ten meters of water, so it's it's shallow. It, it likes protected bays, and so many of the 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 shallow protected bays of Gambier Island, Bowen Island. Um, the Sunshine Coast have eelgrass beds and um, people pay attention to them because they're considered to be nursery um, places for all sorts of small fish. They're tremendously rich in, in um, sort of aquatic life um, and are probably the, the prim, primo um, sort of marine shallow water habitat. Uh, so currently um, the, the Islands Trust mapped all the uh, eelgrass throughout Howe How Sound and um, following on that a group called Sea Change is currently uh, conducting a number of restoration projects where they are um, basically harvesting from healthy beds and transplanting to areas where they've been damaged. A boat moorage is a common um, impactor on eelgrass beds, people mooring their boats and, and the chains dragging on the bottom and, and ripping out the uh, eelgrass. But that's, I think, one of the really the great little restoration stories afoot right now in Howe Sound is the, the eelgrass work. So it's, it's Howe Sound or the, um, the Sea Change Marine Conservation uh, Society, I think, um, is the active agent on that. I noticed there are a couple And I'm going to have a movie about it. <clears throat> I noticed there are a couple of questions in the chat, Rosemary. Okay. Uh, one of them, what's happening with wood fiber LNG? Are, are there any actions needed there? Or do you want to wait that? We, let's wait on that until uh, perhaps that uh, longer question period at the end okay. uh, of the evening. And also a question from Cynthia Lee. Are you checking out the new campsites being built by SCA BC? Yes, we are. And uh, they are doing a remarkable job. Uh, from when that uh, video that Bob and I shot that you just saw uh, was taken to last summer, uh, there has been a huge amount of volunteer effort and resources put into uh, at least five of those uh, Sea to Sky Marine Trail campsites. Um, state-of-the-art composting toilets, uh, spectacular bridge work across creeks for access to big tent pads, um, uh, bear-proof containers for food, uh, none of which were there when Bob and I were uh, there on our first run. So uh, Scott BC in partnership uh, with the Sea to Sky Marine Trail have really made those campsites a priority. And uh, I think anybody going uh, into Howe Sound at Katsum this summer uh, will have some um, high-end accommodation to look forward to. Okay, I, do you wanna go on with the, Cindy's got a question, but then we should maybe go on with the rest of the presentation. It's not urgent. I just wondered if that was eel grass we saw in the movies that you sort of landed in there. Was that eel grass? I am not actually sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's shift gears here a bit. We have sort of talked about um, the, the, the recovery of how sound um, through sort of the eyes of, of the return of marine mammals, but it's also, you know, the, the house on recovery is about the recovery. I think of the, of our community's human spirit to stand up for this place. Um, when I think back to 2013, we were all talking about the whales and dolphins. I mean, we were all used to the quiet ocean and suddenly it was a busy ocean. Um, and every time there was a sighting, the news spread fast, photos were flying around. It was very, sort of, very, it was a very electric period. And it completely flipped the idea that we were living beside a sick water body, which some of us had sort of just assumed. Um, you know, to me, the modern era of our community at Katsum Howe Sound began in um, 2013. 
Um, when uh, Ruth Simons in the Future of How Sound Society organized uh, a big coming together of the community, over a hundred different community groups attended. And it really um, showed all of us that there was a huge will to make things better uh, within the community. And um, that kicked off a series of community forums that talked about marine planning, talked about local economy, um, then influential organizations like the David Suzuki Foundation and OceanWise um, started big education and conservation projects in Howe Sound. Um, local governments started to meet together really in earnest uh, under the umbrella of uh, what we call the Howe Sound um, Community Forum um, and with S Squamish Nation as a real partner in those discussions. Uh, citizen science exploded. There was the discovery of the glass sponge reefs that some of you may have heard of. Uh, there was big restoration work up on the Squamish River estuary. Um, and then in 2015, um, we launched an initiative for the UNESCO Biosphere uh, Reserve. And so, you know, with all this um, firepower activated, when the Ministry of Forests proposed logging on Gambier Island in 2014, like a huge protest erupted and um, those plans got shelved. In 2015, there was a gravel mine proposed for McNabb Creek. Another big protest and opposition um, erupted. That project is still on hold. Um, in 2013, the old wood fiber pulp mill was bought as an LNG facility. Uh, and that right from the get-go drew opposition. Um, we don't know whether that project will ever go ahead or not. Um, they say it will. Um, a lot of people say it won't. Um, but what it did do is spawn a really powerful new advocacy group, My, um, My Sea to Sky, which is now sort of a leading environmental voice in the sound. Um, so, you know, through all the protests, we've built capacity along the way. Um, so, you know, I, we have a real activist community today with uh, so much going on. And so I think I'll turn it to Tim then to jump in here and talked um, about sort of our experience with the Gambier Island logging proposal. Harry Tempest Williams, a uh, great Southwestern writer, uh, <clears throat> once said, we can create beauty through the dailiness of our lives, standing our ground in the places that we love. Mm -hmm. And that has been what has happened in the last five years five to 10 years in uh, at Katsum House Sound. People that are now identifying with where they live in, in a way they never did before. And in April of 2014, uh, Bob and I uh, decided to spend uh, an entire day on the wild side of Gambier Island. And we went in at Camp Artaban and we went up to Lost Lake and then sort of, uh, went overland to Gambier Lake and then down Gambier Creek to the Jewel Pool and then up over the Remarkables, this spony vine, uh, this spony, bony spine of high country uh, that takes you back to Camp Artaban uh, with Lost Lake at the bottom. And um, it was a remarkable day. Uh, trout, uh, when we crossed Gambier Creek, uh, freshwater swims like nothing you could find anywhere. Uh, ocean swims off beautiful beaches, gorgeous old growth forests, uh, and spectacular forever views from uh, those high bluffs that look south uh, from the Remarkables. And um, we get back and within a couple of days we discover that the whole area that we've walked and swum and and waded through is uh, slated to become two Ministry of Forests woodlots, uh, uh, locally run, but nonetheless still a commercial operation. And uh, very quickly, uh, um, word got out and the reaction on the internet was fierce. And over the next, couple of months, the Ministry of Forests didn't realize the hornet's nest that they had kicked. And um, there was good news at the end of it. With, within that year, we realized that um, 
there would, you know, the Ministry of Forests pulled their proposal from the table and we had a victory. But um, as David Brower, uh, you know, the Archdruid, great US conservationist once said, uh, our victories are temporary. And the uh, defeats are permanent. And uh, it is a reminder uh, to all of us that organizations like the Gambier Island Conservancy are so critically important. Uh, and one of the actions that we are encouraging uh, any, anyone in the audience to consider tonight is, is a membership in the Gambier Island Conservancy because it, it helps fund the good, good projects that are being taken on. And uh, it gets you, uh, uh, you know, inside on the latest breaking news uh, from the wolf pack mm -hmm. on the east side of the island. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it's also just a reminder that, um, you know, the, the good work that needs to be done uh, is what explains why this remarkable recovery in at Katsum House Sound is happening. People have bothered to show up and maybe individually their contribution is modest, but together it, uh, it has been huge as Bob has indicated. So we were gonna do some questions. Okay, uh, if anybody else has questions, just raise your hand. Um, I just, can I start by asking, uh, Tim, is there any other tracks on Gambier that are under pressure for logging right now? Uh, yes, the, the Whispering Creek area over in the southwest corner, it's a commercial woodlot that has been in mm -hmm. uh, one family's hands for uh, a gen generations. Uh, and uh, it but is going. It is going ahead, uh, but there is numerous studies that are being done uh, at the eleventh hour to see if the degree of the cut can be um, uh, pulled back. Uh, there's species at risk: long-tailed frogs that uh, uh, are endemic to Gambier Island that, uh, that are at risk. And so that, that story is, uh, uh, is very current right now. And um, uh, there are good people that are uh, following that. And, uh, you know, uh, right now, uh, that Southwest corner of Gambier has had a history of commercial logging. Um, whereas what I was referring to earlier, um, you know, uh, when you stand at Wild Heart Lookout in, at the top of the Remarkables and look south, you don't see a single cut block on the entire island for as far as the eye can see. The only cut block is over on the, on the mainland side at McNabb Creek. So it's very, very unique that Gambier Island has kept its commercial logging to the southwest corner. Uh, and, and there is a fight, as I said, that's ongoing right now. And uh, uh, become a member and, and stay posted. Okay. I don't see anything in the chat. Anybody's hands up? H how much of the um, island, Gambier Island, is actually still old growth? Uh, not that much. Uh, there's, there's remnant pockets. Uh, it, was, it was cut uh, early 20th century. Um, but in the uh, hard to get to places uh, above Lost Lake uh, in, in, in the very high country, uh, you'll find some incredible uh, Douglas fir trees that are first growth or original. Um, and there are, there are maps, the Conservancy has maps of, that have, uh, have the old growth uh, marked. But I think the bigger story on Gambier is the quality of the second growth forest. And that's what we want to maintain. Hello, I have a question. Yes. 
Bob Turner, are you a geologist? My name is Anne. Uh, I am. I met you 30 years ago through the David Suzuki Foundation. You won't remember me, but we had this conversation about how people um, thought the government would look after them if they built on the Sea to Sky Highway and they weren't taking responsibility for um, the stability of the geology. It was many, many years ago. It's quite amazing. Well, no, I, I did quite a few talks about sort of the geological hazards along the Sea to Sky Highway, which is pretty notorious actually, in terms of just the, the numbers of lives lost since the early 19th century. So um, I, you know, Anne, I, I can't see your face, but I, you're, you're, it's, a, it's a familiar conversation. Um, I'm remembering something. Really? Well, maybe one day we'll get to say hello, um, but it's really quite amazing. 30 years ago, <laughs> I had a conversation with you about people driving along the Sea to Sky Highway, rocks falling down on and killing drivers. And I said, oh, well, I expect the government to look after us. And you said, no, it's, that's not how it works. <laughs> if there's an earthquake, the government cannot be there to save us. Something to that effect. Well, um, it's really neat to say hello. And um, maybe I'll meet you at the church one day or through Tomiko. Okay, um, we only really have, and we only have five minutes left now. I think before we get break out into a bigger Q and A, so hang on, and we'll talk some more. Um, Bob and Tim, are you going to give us a little uh, update on the Biosphere Initiative? I'll speak to that right now. Um, okay. Rosemary, yeah. So in 2015, uh, Ruth Simons with the the um, a Future of How Sound Society approached me about working on an initiative to get a How Sound designated as a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. Um, and uh, I had been thinking about the idea for a while. And when Ruth said she was ready to go for it, um, I jumped in because anybody who knows Ruth knows she is very organized and she is very determined. Um, and so a small group of us came together and we started working on it. And it turned into a huge networking effort to sort of explain to the community why it mattered, what it could do for us. Uh, and through that process, we, we just kept getting endorsements from the, the, the different municipalities and from different organizations. Um, and in December of 2020, we submitted our nomination document to UNESCO. Um, and we will know by June of next year um, whether we got it. But I have a, a deep, deep instinct that we will get it. I, I think we got um, a, a remarkable opportunity for UNESCO to say yes to. Um, so let's back up. So what is a, a UNESCO biosphere? First of all, one of the misperceptions often is that um, it's some type of national park status. Um, in fact, biospheres have no regulatory authority. They don't impose any new rules. That's not how they have sort of approach things. Um, secondly, you know, at a bare minimum, really to be honest, what a, a, a biosphere is, is the capacity of a small NGO um, to facilitate, coordinate and foster a sustainable community. Um, and what, what UNESCO intends from biospheres is that they be experiments in community sustainability really living laboratories that, that breed creative um, solutions to um, environmental um, sustainability. And um, what I learned sort of talking to people over the, over the last five years about, you know, just listening to the reaction to a biosphere and at Katsum House Sound, um, you know, the core nub of it is it, it excites people uh, and it really makes people proud. And I know Tim has said this, that in watching uh, a movie about the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve in, uh, that Perry Sound occurs in in Ontario, he just was sort of filled with sort of a sense of, of pride and pride of place. And I've heard that from um, people who have visited UNESCO biospheres around the world and they're sort of um, what they heard in the people who lived there and described them to them. Um, 
so that the the idea really is that um, I think what what powers people is that the fact that UNESCO would see this our place as a special place creates um, you know a real pride in them and um, helps them really to see what a remarkable place it is. You know, it's it's pretty common for all of us to just not not really see what we have. Oftentimes it's the visitors that come to visit us that, you know, gush all over the place that remind us, wow, yeah, actually this is a pretty cool place. Um, and so what I like about people when they get proud of where they live is that they want to jump in, they want to help out. Um, you know, for me, a biosphere is about raising the bar um, for myself in terms of what I expect of myself. Um, I, I see that in organizations, I see that at local governments, suddenly we're all called to sort of examine whether really what we're doing is good enough. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I loved about the UNESCO application process was that um, they don't want you to tell them what you're going to do. You've already got to be doing it. If to become a biosphere, you have to already be acting as a biosphere. And so for the last two and a half years, you know, our organization really has been working with the, with the community to be biosphere-like. Um, now, just to be clear, the area that we chose for the biosphere includes all the islands and waters of, of Howe Sound, all the waters that drain in from so the, the, sea, the um, Sunshine Coast side, the North Shore, and the biosphere extends about halfway um, up the, the Squamish River watershed. Um, almost as far as Whistler, but Whistler's not in it. And um, so that really is in a nutshell, sort of the biosphere story. What I love about that uh, is how it uh, <clears throat> just raises the potential of raising our expectations. Uh, and, 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 and through that, we ask ourselves what fits and what doesn't. And so I don't live in a biosphere reserve yet. Um, sounds like I might be, might be coming soon, but I already know that the uh, wood fiber LNG uh, does not fit in my home place. And, uh, and so I'd like to just uh, for a minute or two look at the wood fiber LNG uh, as it uh, is can presently. For, can I just stop that? for just a moment? Just stop for just a moment. Yeah. What we usually do is we take a little break for two minutes at eight o'clock for to honor the people that need to leave at eight o'clock. But this is fascinating. It's just getting absolutely fascinating. I love it. And I want us to honor it and give it as much time. We have another half hour for those that choose to stay on and ask further questions. And I feel like this whole biosphere has just, you know, become fascinating. And I'm thinking that a lot of people also are going to want to ask a few questions. But I'm just going to allow Catherine a moment to, to wrap up, talk a few minutes. We're going to take a two minute break and then we got another half hour. So sorry about that, but I just wanted to. No, no, that's good. Time. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Cindy. We, we stopped recording at, uh, at eight o'clock as well. But uh, the best parts of our evenings are nearly always after eight o'clock. So please, we take a two minute break so that people can leave gracefully and then we come back. And so please do. And uh, with that, I think and I'm looking at the clock. A bit about, uh, next